Hi. My name is John Fricke. Uh, a lot of us have met over the years at Ostravaganza. I've been the MC pretty much annually since 1990. And I've written books about Oz, books about Judy Garland, done documentaries, and that's how I got the job to be the MC at Ostravaganza. We didn't meet last year because of the pandemic. And this year, everything is coming together hallelujah, but not quite soon enough for 30,000 people to congregate in Chittenango, Frank Baum's hometown. So we're doing some very special virtual recorded interviews with people who are to become special guests at Ostravaganza. And the speeches we're going to be showing you, the interviews we're going to be showing you this weekend uh, will not only be available now, but they will go into the All Things Oz Museum archive. So we're serving a dual purpose here. We've got a great variety of guests and the gentleman I want you to meet right now uh, has a very special connection to the Wizard of Oz movie, which is pretty much the way most of us found Oz in the first place. Let me take you back. 83 years ago, late spring, 1938, things were starting to cook at MGM because of the Wizard of Oz movie. You have to remember, and whenever I talk about the film, I say this, there was no such thing as CGI, no computer generated images. Everything had to be made as the old saying went from whole cloth. And you'll find out just how true that old saying is when, when you meet our guest and he and I get to talking. Everything had to be imagined and then realized. And there was trial and error and we'll hear about that because there was one man who oversaw all the special effects for The Wizard of Oz and countless other movies at MGM across many decades. Uh, the special effects for The Wizard of Oz were uh, given Academy Award consideration in 1939. Everybody who saw the film, the critics, the public, raved about what had been accomplished. And um, this book is the autobiography of that one man. And it certainly, uh, the title certainly describes him. It's called The Wizard of MGM, Memoirs of A. Arnold Gillespie, Art Director, Head of Special Effects from 1924 to 1965. And our guest today is one of the co-editors of that book, and that eminently qualifies him to speak about Buddy Gillespie, as A. Arnold was best known. He is also eminently qualified because he's Buddy Gillespie's grandson. Please welcome Robert Welsh. Robert, you're on. John, you're too kind, way too kind, and it's an honor to be here. It's a pleasure, and I think this is the first time, and I really hope that you all enjoy some of the behind the scenes here that we're going to share with you. Um, it's, it's all about um, the movie. It's all about the practical effects. It's all about, quite frankly, sharing with you the things that they thought about, John, as you just said, and this is going to be an interesting conversation that we're going to have, and hopefully you can see the screen. Can you, John? Yes, hopefully. perfectly. Okay, perfect. Okay, so we're going to talk about the secrets of Oz. So we're going to review a few little things from behind the scenes here. And of course, I'm your host, Robert Welch. And uh, we're going to have a little fun with this. Um, yes, that's true. And that's pretty much me. That'll be me for a while. Not, not so much John, me. They'll okay, be thrilled that there's not so much John. They, trust me, go for it. <laughs> That's funny. My middle name is Arnold, and I was actually named after my uh, grandfather. So my initials are R A W Raw. I think my family had some fun with that, but we'll just keep it to that. But but we're really here to talk about the 1939 Wizard of Oz, which was a phenomenal movie, one of my grandfather's favorites, quite frankly, because of all that went into it. There was heart and soul, a lot of practical effects, a lot of visual effects, and a lot of special effects. And we'll get into what's special about special effects in just a minute. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to give away some of the secrets of how these things were made, some of the special effects. And it's kind of fun, quite frankly, if you are a movie buff to see some of the behind the scenes. Things, secrets that you will have as you watch the movie that other people won't by watching this particular this presentation. So we're going to have a little fun with that. So with that, let's kind of figure out now what a special effect is. Now, 
This is going way back in time. This is the black and white films. This is what they call practical effects. Things are made. These are very tactical. This happens to be a uh, tank lot three. MGM had a huge studio lot. They employed well over 50,000 people at one point. They were a city, a small city. And this was the domain of creating things like uh, tankers exploding, Ben-Hur 1959, the ships uh, that were uh, in battle, all kinds of interesting things. Lassie, the set of Lassie was built on Tank Lot 3. But just to take you back to what a special effect is, I want you to think about something. If you had to make a movie about an atom bomb, and nobody had ever seen the atom bomb, and you were the one responsible for coming up with this idea. How do you do this? Well, Buddy created a couple of ideas. He, he played around with pyrotechnics, explosion things. They just didn't feel right. And one day he was thinking, he was thinking about this prior movie he did with Johnny Weissmuller. And you know all who Johnny is, he's Tarzan. He is Tarzan, the epitome of Tarzan. And where Tarzan was stabbing the side of a crocodile, and, and the crocodile, this is filled to black and white, had a grossine dye in it for blood, and they were underwater. And of course, the crocodile wasn't real. It was a, it was a rubber body. And he saw that, that kind of blood coming out. Now, we've all had a cup of coffee. Obviously, I've had about 12 today. <laughs> uh, but we pour a little cream into coffee. And if you think about that from a cream and coffee perspective, well, that's how the atom bomb was done. It's also how things were, were built for like explosions to happen. Instead of exploding things in the tank lot three, what they did is they took a fancy thing called a, stay with me now, water balloon. They filled it with different colors and they dropped it from the berms of the studio and superimposed that so people didn't get hurt. And then to make it really effective, you can see down here, they just dropped things in water as, as if something exploded. And they mapped out all the explosions on top. That is a special effect. So we always have this idea in special effects is we don't think right. We see something, we go through Home Depot or something like that. We're like, hey, I can make something out of that. So we're very artistic in nature. Isn't that fun? I'm not arguing. So, <laughs> so let's let's see what the Wizard of Oz special effects happen to be. We'll take this particular scene. And uh, John, I'm sure you recognize this scene as they're skipping off from uh, the Lion's Forest. Here, let's make that a little bit bigger so we can all see. All right, so yeah. this is an interesting scene for us to kind of break down from a practical effect and also a special effect perspective. And let's see if the PowerPoint gods will, will appease us here and get this video to play. Come on, video. So this is called a matte painting, and we'll dig into what matte paintings are. And then we have this practical set, which see, it doesn't have, see the lights on the upper right? It's covering that area. And that back area is called a backdrop, or also called a psych, a painted psych. And the cornfield was one of the biggest uh, painted psychs ever built, by the way. And you see how the matte line matches exactly where the set is. Now, also remember that this is the Cowardly Lion and the rest of the crew um, basically skipping down the, uh, the yellow brick road. Well, if you remember, the, the lion had a tail that moved. And that tail was articulated by a guy in a fishing with a fishing pole up in the berms, up in the rafters, two wires to make it look, look like it was moving. If you look really closely at the top where the mat line and the practical comes together, and we'll zoom in again, you'll see the trees move right there, just right where the practical set is, and not where the mat painting is. So now it's a little interesting, now, looking at this from a practical perspective, this is a special effect of how to make the lion's tail articulate, make everything come together, and make the set all work together. Isn't that fascinating? Well, to and me, it so is. What, you're, what you're basically saying is that the leaves are moving because the uh, fishing uh, rod and the fishing line, the line is getting caught in the tree leaves as they go past the tree. Is that? That's right. And right where the, where the mat line is, you don't see it move at all. Right, exactly. So, yeah, and again, the only thing that was actually built is uh, like the, as we're looking at the screen, it's the right hand edge of the yellow brick road all the way over to the left side of the, um, the picture. Where the trees are on the right, that is all uh, matte painting. And matte then there's painting. the psych in the back that shows the yellow brick road going off into the distance. Is that right? That's right. And, and painting, that's basically a large painting in the back for those kind of bluish trees. And so it's, it, think of like a shower curtain of sorts, a big shower curtain that's all been painted. 
It's painted on muslin, in fact. Actually, I just wanted to make sure that I was getting it right so that uh, in case anybody else had questions. Thank you, Robert. You can you yeah, you're move welcome. on now. Yep. No, by the way, these rocks come up. If we if we go to do this again, I'll give you another secret about these rocks. And there's some interesting things just about these rocks that come up. So more secrets to be had. <laughs> okay. So who were these special effects people? Well, my this is my grandfather on right head side. Thank you. I, well, I, applause isn't mine, it's for his. Um, this is Warren Newcomb. Warren was in charge of matte paintings. Often when they did a shot like this, they would call it a Newcomb shot. And Warren Newcomb was the uh, architect for the Academy Award. This is one of Buddy's Academy Award. This is for his first one. And this is for something called Green Dolphin Street. Uh, I know, yes, it's in tape, VHS. Who has a VHS tape player anymore? Yeah, and all the kids are like, what is that? It's, it's called VHS. It's, this is after Betamax. So anyway, so play along. And then Cedric Gibbons was in charge of all this together. So all the things we just saw, the practical set, the painting of the backdrops, the matte painting from Warren Newcomb, the Newcomb shots, and the special effects was all under Cedric Gibbons. This is why you see the art director, the big think guy, and all these other people listed here. And so special effects, Arnold Gillespie, is to do these interesting things, like the tornado, which we'll get into, and some other fun things. So this is what a special effect is. It's not a matte painting. It's not something, it's something yet new that or undiscovered. Kind of fun. So let's talk about another special effect. You've all seen this, or maybe you haven't seen this rendition. You've seen this rendition. And this rendition is what is in the final. Uh, and now, if you don't know who Dorothy is, I, I'm, I'm going to just ask you, uh, you must attend the Wizard of Oz convention here that we're talking about uh, and learn more about who Dorothy is or, or, or go down to your beta VHS tape store and rent Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Do they even have blockbusters anymore? Oh, obviously we're going back in time. <laughs> so how is this done? And many of you have read our, uh, Al Jean Hartman's book, but this is the details. This is called a Form 48. And my grandfather started art, uh, 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 dialoguing with people. How are we going to keep up with uh, knowing what the practical effect is, when it's going to be uh, taped, what the production number was. Production number for Wizard of Oz 1939 was 1060. John, you know this. I mean, you, you know this by the back of your head. Here are the number of takes that they did. 19 takes in action that they filmed, well over 30 takes overall. Surrender Dorothy or Die, WWW, was written by the director and everybody else to say, this is what we're gonna put in there, but that was cut. Also not known is, as you can see down here, is you've got Surrender Dorothy, and then you've got a, a cut, and then you've got another take where you see the sir, and these are different takes. So they took each one of these different takes and they spliced them together in the movie. And you think it's just all one cohesive thing, and it's not. The other interesting thing is, notice this backdrop. This backdrop here is a technicolor, uh, basically clouds, blue, uh, a background with white clouds. And I'm going to show you how this comes up again. These, If you're making something, you're going to reuse it a couple of times, obviously, right? So this was done, obviously, in a tank, six by six, four inches in deep, with a milky liquid in it. But there's a trick to it, a little bit more trick. You see how it looks like it's going across the sky like wind, right? If you see somebody doing some sky riding, you see that wind? Well, not only did they do it backwards with a stylus, they had to make it look like it was moving. Well, you can't just put a fan on water because it'll just make it disappear. They poured water in one side and they drained it out the other to make the water move as the person who was 10 feet up in the air riding backwards with that stylus of the witch that was less than an inch in, in diameter. Isn't that fascinating? To me, it is. Okay, that's well, just fun again, stuff. You're, you're pointing out what we said, that everything about in that film had to be made by hand or for real. They couldn't just you know imagine it on a laptop. And it has to be something that you go out and you would see and you would believe. And without, if it was just stagnant there, you say, oh, you know, it's, it's not going to be believable. Um, a couple of years ago, I did a financial analysis on this. It would be 120 grand worth today just for this one little setup here. Okay. So it's, it's interesting how this works. Now, this scene here, as you've all seen, which is the witch coming out of the dais, 
This is the form 48 for that. So this is the miniature of the witch. And um, what Buddy did is he measured the witch and how big uh, she would be as she flew out and figured out based upon the whole size of everything, how big would be. The miniature witch was about a foot in length. And it was just guided by four wires just to keep it uh, in straight. And it was slung around with something called basically a rail. Think of a, like a racetrack. Okay, so, so they they put the racetrack up there, put some rollers, same way they did, by the way, the flying monkeys. But the flying monkeys had articulated arms. This was just on a rail and they pulled it. That's all they did. Now, you say, well, how big was this right here? Well, this is a good, you know, 16, 17 feet in. And it was made with cardboard. It's a flat surface. It looks like it's got depth to it because that's how good the painter was on it. Isn't that wild? And what I love too, the, the picture on the top left of the tower, and you can kind of get the sense that the witch is flying out. Yes, the stepladder there so that they yes, could- And there's, there's a gentleman right here and he's got a color pattern to make sure that it's all right. And so this is the top of his head, right there, this little dot, and he's reaching up his arm as far as he can. So you take that and times two, so we'll say it's that's, you know, 12 feet and add a few more. And then you backlight it and you put it, basically uh, you change the backing itself, you change the backing. And remember the backing that we just showed you where um, it was the, uh, the surrender or die, there's the same backing right there, reused. So they filmed the backing, they rear projected it onto the surrender or die and they put it all together. Isn't that cool? It's wonderful. Well, to me, okay, to me, it's it's super cool. Well, I think to anybody who loves the Wizard of Oz, it's cool. <laughs> so this is how they did it from a practical sec perfect, uh, effects perspective. Now, this is fun too. And you've seen this a, a few times where you take this thing called a process shot and you shoot a bunch of process shots and you put them all together and then you project them from the rear. Yes, it's all true. Yet you just rear project the thing after you put it together. Now, everybody today understands that. But back in the day, this was revolutionary. A process shot is just rear projection. A map painting's in front, process is rear projection. It's kind of like if you took a projector today and you just shot it on a screen. We've all done that today, but back in the day, this was revolutionary. Now, they did you know about 20 different takes. Some of them actually got cut. There were some things that were not appropriate, we'd say, anymore. But here's that list and the transformation of Mrs. Gulch, uh, Walter on a bicycle. I'll leave that for you and the historians. I'm going to leave that as a clue. Walter on a bicycle. Uh, and there were some other things too, Mrs. Colch and Walter on a bicycle near the station. I won't give away the clues. Some of you people already know what that is, but we'll leave that there. And that was in there. Okay. I, yeah, I know, John, of course, you know. <laughs> now, I want you to see this particular scene. So you've got the rear projection. And what we're going to do is we're going to tilt the camera just a bit to make, make it look like we're moving around. But this is a small set. This is a very small set. And let's see if the PowerPoint people will uh, allow us to play this. Okay, now we've seen this a, a hundred times, at least not a thousand, right? And if you notice right here, you've got this bouncing picture. Well, why is it bouncing? What, what, what's, what's making that bounce? Well, it's because this backing here, this wall is made of muslin. Back in the day, where we didn't have all these OSHA regulations, we just put up pillars, you know, we put basically painted up muslin, and this is a, it's a glorified picture, large picture. And that's what this is. A lot of the sets back in the day were very practical. They just put up the muslin, painted it, away they go, and the teardown was so easy. And in some cases, you could actually see, and I'll show you in just a second, how easy they were to come down. So now that you see that, you see this muslin, and you see kind of the, the wind going too, now you go, oh, that's why that was moving. And I want to, again, I want to clarify for people of, as far as rear projection, Buddy and his crew made the film of the whirling clouds and all the things flying through them. And when that film was completed and edited together, they then would have had it on a projector on the other side or beyond Dorothy's window. There was a, a movie screen and they would be f shooting that film that they took on that screen and filming it from out here where Dorothy's bed is so that basically they're filming a movie of a movie is that 
accurate? That, you got it exactly right. Okay. And this was a standard thing to do to take uh, Cary Grant and put him in France or uh, in San Francisco, for example, where you have them, you know, transported into San Francisco itself. You would build a stage, you do a big projection uh, on a uh, whatever size screen was required at the time. And this is why people always do this, because you want to figure out wh where am I going to shoot? And then sometimes these projection screens were very large. And here's another interesting fact, and we, I'm not going to show it in here. Um, if we get back together again, there was a very large three projection shot of when the flying monkeys are coming down in the haunted forest. That back screen that you see with the flying monkeys, that was a process shot of the miniature monkeys landing as a big process shot, three screen process shot beyond the trees. So remember where the monkeys were landing and you see them landing practically with the, you know, everybody could see the wires. Well, in the back was a huge projection screen. Wow. Wonderful. Fascinating stuff. Anyway, yeah. okay, you to me. Okay, okay, behind the scenes, another caution. Oh, you dirty brat. Um, so in this shot here, <laughs> what we have is, remember, this is just painted. And you can see it here. It's just brush strokes, right? And for those of us who build sets and things like that, it's always about threes. You put, the, you put a first layer on, second layer, and then you kind of dry brush things together, right? Well, in this particular scene, you can see where the lion, if the PowerPoint will work, and hopefully it will, if not, we'll talk about, is right here, the lion comes in and leans up against the wall, and you can see it push in. And I'll just leave it at that so you can watch the movie one more time and see it. But the lion coming coming in and leaning up against there is a clue to this is just a very easily uh, tear down scene. You could tear down this this whole set in less than a day. So it's fabric stretched on a frame. Fabric stretch on a frame, no more than that. Muslin. Muslin was used a lot. Less wood, more muslin. Why? Because they were trying to save every penny. This is a studio and every penny counted. So they put more into everything else and didn't have to put it into the set. So, so that's all matte paintings and things like that. We'll get into more matte paintings and practical sets and practical sets are made up of muslin and, and barely any wood there and rear projection process shots. So let's get down to miniatures, which is another special effect. This is the famous farmhouse. Now, if you look at this from a farmhouse perspective, here's the farmhouse. And this were where we had the front of the farmhouse. And of course, this was the back of the farmhouse. So the horses ran out. This right here is where the root cellar were, was, where they went underneath to get away from the, uh, the tornado. And um, it, oh, okay, not the tornado, the twister, sorry, uh, to get away from the twister now that I've been corrected. And you may remember in the first scenes of Wizard of Oz where Mrs. Gulch went down the road and then made a right. Well. Every miniature was built specifically to the set, the full size and every set that went around this. So much so that even it went down to where practical trees on the set that caused a shadow would be duplicated in miniature on the miniature set. Now here's another tip. This was only about 40 feet deep. To make this look like it's deeper, you remember back in second grade when we all did horizon point, horizon line? Remember drawing back in the day? And what did we all do? We drew basically a point and then we drew all these lines out, right? Well, these cornrows here are all in towards horizon point to give you that sense of depth. And they went smaller and smaller and smaller. So this is how they made it look like it was a much larger set. The other interesting thing to note is this is used not only in miniature here, but it's also used in the practical set where Dorothy is trying to get home. And we've seen this before. Now, looking at these, you've got the rear projection, you've got the foreground set, and then you have the acting in front of it. It's always threes. And we'll, we'll strategically place something here to hide something in miniature, which is this plowing hole. So you take that, you put that together, and what you end up with is a real practical set, rear projection again. Oh, it keeps wanting to go forward. I guess this wants me to go faster is what it is, John. You put that together, and now you're reusing the miniature in a practical set. And this is what we put on, uh, by the way, on the 75th anniversary DVD. Um, so a buddy of mine put together this whole reel of how this all works with the rear projection. 
And so this, this gives us a sense of how it all works, how miniatures works, and also we'll go into, when we get together, I'll show you more about how the, how the tornado was built, literally how it was built. And it's fascinating stuff. So practical set and you can reuse it. Talk about practical now, fire. Can't get any more practical than that. So in the water play ball scene, which is scene number uh, 84 or set number 84, stage lot two, and this is um, uh, here, is we have this interesting thing that happens. Well, did she really have a fireball and strategically? I mean, how many times could Margaret Hamilton hold a fireball and, tr and shoot it out there? Well, no, what it was is a, a double printing. The ball of fire was double printed, was made using a gas torch. So again, they went to a stage, they turned all the lights off, and they filmed the, the gas, basically the gas torch going across a wire. Now there's a flub in here, but before I get to that, there's a couple of things I want you to note. Down here, we have this huge camera. In Wizard of Oz, in Technicolor, there's three strips of film. There's the red, green, and blue all in sync to give us that, that depth of color. This thing weighed over 200 pounds, just the camera alone. This was the setup. Now, Margaret Hamilton was up here as the scene was playing out the whole time. And all she had to do was just mimic that. Now, here's the flub, and some of you have already seen this. The flub is, watch this area right here. The fire starts before it lands. The timing is off just a bit. So the fire starts right there because there's this little gas lantern underneath. And the gas lantern, for those of you who've collected photos, that's what's happening right here. This production assistant is rigging the lighting. It's a flint lighter. It's a remote flint lighter that's strung across a wire underneath. So he clicks the flint and it lights up the fire that's underneath the fake grass. Pretty cool, huh? To make this whole thing work. Anyway, okay, some things are just cool for me. So this is the Form 48 that goes along with that. And that's what all the details are that you see. So now let's switch over to, if we're, we're, we're okay on time, I hopefully, well, is, is this good stuff? Well, oh, it's all great stuff. I just don't want to, uh, we have to time out these interviews. So uh, uh, go ahead. Okay, good. So let's, let's do two, a couple more, okay? Just a couple more, okay? What's your whistle? Witch's dais. So when you look at the witch's dais and you look at the schematic of it, you have this process shot. Again, a process shot. We know what a process shot is now. It's rear screen projection, okay? We have this process screen. We have this practical set backdrop. We have a dead door here. There's a door here. It's called dead door, which looks like a door, it's a door, but it doesn't go anywhere. And then you also have something called a wild unit. Wild unit is we've all built or some of us built, you know, stage play thing. That means it's on wheels and you can move it around. Right here is that horoscope looking thing, right? So this is for fortune telling. So the witch was a fortune teller as well. So that's what that's all about. But right here, you could see where the crystal ball is. Now, if you look at the elevation, elevation zero, which means everything on the floor, there's nothing raised. So the crystal ball actually was used just earlier by Boris Karloff in The Man from Fu Manchu. That was the first movie it was in. And it is right now in the Walker Library. Okay, so it still exists. So how did they do this rear projection, if you will, or this projection onto this crystal ball? By the way, this is Betty Danko. This, this uh, photo here is where they were gonna practice having Betty jump out, hover a bit, and then fly out. So remember the miniature we were talking about before? So she was gonna hover there a bit and then fly out. There's nothing above this. So they could rig her up with wires, okay? So, in this dais, what we're doing is we're going to take a camera and we're going to shoot it at the crystal ball. But inside the crystal ball, we'll put a film in there. And this is an old technique called Pepper's Ghost. If, like We've all gone to haunted houses and somebody appears and we know it's just a reflection of something and somebody off to the side. We're going to use Pepper's Ghost. So we have this idea of incident and reflection. And inside the crystal ball, we, we will put this little film in there and it's 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 a translucent film it's like uh it's it's almost like a, a half mirror of sorts and it's just enough to get the reflection going and you can actually see right here where they're testing is and this gentleman's going across where they've got the projector pointed at this and that angle of incidence response is coming back at us so the response that angle of response is where the camera is okay so that's what that is 
Now you can see the film just barely in here where you're going from the angle of incidence to response right in there. So anything you shoot here goes here and it bounces back. And they, we, we set the lens such that it was only gonna project on that. The flub on this is, as you watch the rear of this and the dais itself, you'll see that glow too. You'll see some of the imagery there because it, it bleeds out a bit. And remember like Pepper's glow, Ghost, you can have some of that that goes through the film, uh, the film that's in the glass, okay? So let's get to matte paintings and I'll, hit, I'll, I'll finish with matte paintings, okay? So there was a lot of matte paintings and matte paintings were only about sometimes three feet you know, wide and maybe a, a two and a half feet uh, tall. They weren't that big, but they were used a lot, a lot to put people into places or extend a set that you wouldn't normally. And so you've seen a lot of these, these before, some were used, some weren't, and some that you may not have realized there was a matte painting. Like, for example, uh, so what's a matte painting? Let me, let me break that down. Matte painting was invented way back in the Charlie Chaplin days. And what they used to do is take a piece of glass, put it in front of the camera. They would matte out or black out a certain area, roll back the, 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 the tape, and then film the top portions of it. You composite those two on the same piece of film. You project it twice because it's blacked out. It didn't get uh, exposed. And therefore you go like that. Now, so it's, it actually is combining those two things. And sometimes it's farther away. Now, by the way, just a bit of trivia, um, you know who James Cameron is, Jim Cameron. He started off as a matte painter. So yeah, yeah, that's how we started off. He was More just titanic. a painter and then a matte painter. And yeah, that's, so he would do things like this on glass. So, and, and so can you do this yourself? Absolutely. There, you, you could make this very easy. It's, it's not that hard. Um, you, you can put yourself in different locations very easily. If you just think of, you know, outside the box of where do you want to be today? You could be in the Wizard of Oz. You could be in the Land of Oz. You could be anywhere you want to just by coming up with something practical. And it doesn't take much work. <laughs> it's kind of fun, huh? <laughs> So here's one of the ones that are matte paintings, which are really, you know, not well known, which is just this green area as the troop or actually the, um, the B team, if you will, uh, the, the are basically going up, scammering up uh, the side of the, the mountain to get to the, the castle itself, which is castle. So this right here is where the matte painting line is. And if you look closely at it, you'll see the dust not come over this area. You'll see the dust as they're climbing. Uh, it's, a, it's basically go behind this area here. So it, it revealed itself if you're looking very carefully, but that's one of the matte paintings that really wasn't um, well known. This one is definitely known, this uh, exterior battlements one. Now we have this battlements area, but to make this area here work well, this, this basically this river look really good is we'll put pinholes in here, little tiny pinholes. And remember back in the day when we used to have Christmas tinsel Remember Christmas tinsel and we yeah. spent, we put Christmas tinsel behind this to make it look like the water shimmering. Oh, wow. So you take a matte painting, split some things in there and you've got shimmering, shimmering light and it makes it look like a river. So how does that look? Well, we've got the practical set and see if this will play out here. Practical set, we've got the matte painting. We'll align these in an optical printer one over the other because the matte painting is in front and we'll uh, superpose each one of these together. And that's how that all works. The most famous of all matte paintings is the exit from Munchkinland. This was really well done. It was one of the first shots done in matte painting, but there's a flub, one flub. Last, okay, this last tip here, and hopefully I'm not ruining for you, but this was, as you can see here, and I'll play it back again, you've got the Area to be exposed, which is the practical set. And by the way, this set ends right there. It's just a it, it, it's it's just a lift that happens at the edge, right there. That's where that line is. She can't go much farther. In fact, she's looking like she's going to go for miles, and she's got two more steps to go. Well, in this set right here, right there where the matte painting line is, the Munchkins are underneath. And you can see them when we put this together that the munchkins are actually underneath the flowers and bleeding through the matte painting. That was a flub. That was not intentional. You can't, you don't, you don't really see it. But if you notice that the munchkins are superimposed on the mat, not intentional, but nobody noticed it until I just, you know, expose it now. So with that, <laughs> 
that's the end of the presentation. <laughs> There's a lot more, a lot more fun that we can be had, a lot more tricks of the trade to be had. Oh, no, you didn't come a long way for nothing. We're going to do something just for guests, and we'll have information on this. And so the team will tell you, we're going to give away to some special person a free copy of the book. Maybe more. We'll see how many good answers there are. <laughs> and the, the directions as to how to apply for that copy of the book will be will be showing you on your screen right now. So that's how you'll find out about it. Otherwise, uh, we are going to make sure that the All Things Oz gift shop has copies of The Wizard of MGM. The book is extraordinary. The uh, buddy worked on all these famous films. The book is full of the special effects worksheets, the frames uh, that show what was filmed and what was painted. There are many, many pages about The Wizard of Oz. The book has an introduction by Spencer Tracy and Katherine Hepburn. If you have any interest in motion picture history, classic motion pictures, this is a book for you. And uh, if you're an Oz fan, it goes without saying. Robert, I wanna ask you a question, if I may. Um, when, when did you realize how important and unique your grandfather was? When, when did that realization come to you? You know, it's, it's interesting that, uh, John, you asked that. It's, um, I have two stories on that. One is, you know, we used to go over to the house quite a bit. And um, I, I remember seeing, one of my earliest recollections was seeing this tall man. And he had a very deep voice. And uh, my grandfather said, um, you know, this is John Wayne. And uh, hi, nice to meet I have no idea who this person, except I know he's just huge to me as a boy of like four years old. And so there was just, you know, people around the house all the time. And so uh, we had Spencer Tracy over early. Uh, uh, Kate uh, was a, a really good friend. Margaret Hamilton was over quite a bit. They had the girls. And uh, Nell, uh, my grandmother, would have the, you know, the, the, basically like a book club. And, and Margaret was a really good friend. And strangely enough, um, you know, it's, I didn't want to expose my my significant other to all the craziness of the family because you know we we all think differently we all think we have crazy families and then you have these people that are hanging out at the house and so I, she goes no 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 let's go let's do something together I want to meet your family I'm like you really want to meet my family okay so we went on to, over to a Thanksgiving and she's really into Oz I mean she's knows every word and all that and I, I we and I didn't tell her my back because I wanted her to like her for me right. Went over there was margaret hamilton and other people and she looked at me and she said you really know these people and i go well yeah that's margaret there's so-and-so and so-and-so and, so -and, -so. She goes, and she just looked at me and shook her head i go they're just people and my grandmother said we all put our pants on one leg at a time <laughs> and so <laughs> so he goes to me and she goes i had i really didn't know until just now so i it, it was this appreciation but Seeing his passion for everything he did inspired me. He taught me a couple of things, if I, if I may, is never fear anything. Always go after everything with gusto. John, you do this, right? Always keep learning everything. And then not only just believe in yourself, but believe in other people. Everybody around you has a unique story. They have something they can tell you, something they can teach you. Uh, appreciate all the people around you for everything they do. And when it's, he told me those three principles, as a young kid, I kept with him. And that's what I knew he was a special individual, not because of all the other things he was doing, but because of the way he approached things and approached life. That, that, that is a great life lesson. And when you get it from a member of your family who turns out also to be a man who's genius, there's no other word for it, has been embraced and loved by countless millions of people. That's a, a pretty special designation. And if you can carry that into your own life, as you have, uh, you're making the most of it and the best of it. Uh, on behalf of Ostravaganza Virtual, I want to thank Robert for being with us and sharing all of this. As I say, there's so much more to the Oz story, and I hope we will be able to have him as a real guest with um, a little bit more time to spread out and share, answer questions, all of that kind of stuff. But, but Robert, this has been I've been wanting to do this with you for a long time. And I thank you for making it one of the easiest interviews I've ever done because I didn't have to do anything. Thank you very much for everybody. Thank you. You bet.